Welcome to Words at Studio W. My name is Rian. I'm from South Africa. Joining me at the table are four friends, each with their own stories, from both Africa and from the United States. These friends are Lisa from Wallingford, Connecticut, Angelo from Kenya, Oral from Ghana, and Brian from South Africa. We are new friends. We are getting to know one another through storytelling, which is something very inherently African as much as it is universal. We look forward to knowing more about one another, and we look forward to you knowing more about us. And on that note, I turn to Oral from Ghana. Oral is a journalist based currently in Washington, D.C. Yes, sir. Oral has a fine sense of history of his home country, Ghana, and of his resident country, the United States. And on this topic of history, Oral, what is your sense of history? What do you think this history to be and its importance to us? I think even though both countries are located on different continents, we still have some sort of similarities or commonalities in the sense that um, the first slaves that were transported from um, West Africa, precisely Ghana, where the slaves' castles are located in Cape Coast, ended up here in the U.S. When I came to the U.S., the first city I lived in was Alexandria in Virginia, pretty close to Old Town, Alexandria, Virginia. There's the Masonic Temple, and there's the Washington Monument, which is an obelisk. And I look at this, and I think of what history taught me growing up in Ghana in my elementary school days. The obelisk is an Egyptian thing. And I'm here in America and I'm looking at it. I'm like, so who copied who? <laughs> you know? So it's it's a shared history, but you just really have to know where to look and how to look to realize the commonalities involved. Now, because of slavery, racism, and all that, it makes it hard to see the commonalities. Um, Right now, a lot of Africa's history remains in the dark. There's a lot more yet to be discovered about Africa, despite all these new age discoveries. And um, a lot of what is known to have been already discovered were written by non-Africans, by these um, researchers, explorers, and historians from Europe, from the Americas maybe even from the Arabian areas, who are not Africans, but who were genuinely trying to represent what they felt was historic and was key to the history of Africa. In the age in which we live today, we have an amazing opportunity, not just as Africans, but as humans, to tell our own story from our own perspective, in our own way, and it's, it's just a beautiful age. I feel Africa is slowly but surely taking advantage of it because a lot of this history needs to be told from an African perspective for the sake of the future generation. Because a lot of the stuff folks are reading out there, even though it tells the story of Africa, it's not been written or told by the real Africans who own the history and the culture themselves. So yes, there's a huge gap, but yes, there's a huge opportunity to fill that gap thanks to information technology. And we are slowly but surely trying to fill that gap, which is why I became a journalist. I like to shy away from calling myself a journalist. I prefer to identify myself as a storyteller. I'm not an original owner of all the stories I tell. None of them belongs to me. They are stories that I see in the lives of people, whether they're Africans or even non-Africans, but have some sort of connection to the continent. Like our good friend here who went to Rwanda, <laughs> you know, she's not African, but she's had an opportunity to experience Africa in a very personal way, and in a way that also had her impact the people in the country where she was at through her job as a teacher. So, you know, the stories are there to be told. I just feel like, for me, there's a 
mad, mad need for us to tell our stories and tell it really quickly because we're in that stage where if your story is not told and told properly, you might be left behind. And the people without knowledge of their history are people whose future will be very difficult. If I may follow up on that, are we getting the stories out fast enough in this hyper-fast information age? Are these stories moving fast enough, do you think, if you just had to gauge it personally? We have a great platform to move these stories out there really fast, which is the internet. Mm -hmm. you know, and the internet has grown amazingly fast in a short few decades, literally. And in the past five years, for instance, platforms like WhatsApp, Facebook, mm. you know, Instagram, Twitter, which is a microblogging micro website, has taken the growth of the internet really, really fast globally. And so if we as Africans or people who are sympathetic towards the African continent want to tell the African story, this is a great moment to make it happen and make it happen quickly. I feel like the sense of urgency must be there because over the past, let me give you a typical example. Earlier on I said in 2019 it would have been 400 years since slaves were transported through Ghana and parts of West Africa to the Americas and parts of Europe. Of course, we live in an era of fake news where, you know, yes. everyone is wondering, is this authentic? So we're not just telling these stories, but we want to tell them in a way that would be verifiable, where people who do not even know the history can look at it and realize it's authentic, it's true, but we must tell it. And the onus does not only fall on the media, it falls on the art world, the entertainment world. America, for example, uses Hollywood as an information machine, where they get to sell the beauty of America, where they get to sell the culture of America and the history of America. We in Africa can also do it. Nollywood in Nigeria <laughs> has the third largest movie making industry. You mentioned authenticity. Right. And on authenticity, there's nothing quite like the personal story. Right. And the story of the self. And on this, I have to move to Brian. Brian, you have experienced revolution. You've indeed been part of revolution in South Africa, and you have seen a change that was hard fought, that seemed distant many, many times. Even now, many years later, and after almost two and a half decades of you living as a citizen of the United States, what is the lesson we can take from your personal point of view of the story of South Africa? Yeah, during those, those tough times, you know, it was one or two things. Are you going to sit back? and just be pounded by what's going on around you, what are you gonna do about it? And my mom has been my cheerleader all my life. And there was one thing that she ingrained in, into my head and that is, you need to have destiny in your life. You need to follow that. You need to follow. I like, I like the way he said that. It reminds yeah. me of Nelson Mandela. Oh, yeah? You need to have destiny <laughs> in your life. <laughs> does it sound a bit yeah. like it, Brian? Yes, yes, yes. I believe was, you know, I am not going to be like my friends, most of them. I wanted more for myself. And even though it was tough, I mean, I mean, really tough. I used to travel with, with the gymnastics or sport. And then when they stop over for food, I couldn't go in into um, the restaurant with them. I had to go around the corner and get my, my food up from the outside through a little window. Mm -hmm. uh, that type of thing, you know. But it didn't deter me because I was on a mission. I wanted to equip myself. And that's what I did. I um, constantly look for any avenues to equip myself so when the time comes you know i knew that um the racist government wasn't gonna survive all the time that a change is gonna come i wanted to be ready when that time came so um i say to the young people today don't let your circumstances uh, determine your your destiny that's that's nonsense you know 
you need to dream. In fact, therein lies the lesson. Mm -hmm. Because young people, or all people, any generation, will always be faced with that moment where they need to draw on the history, if not of their own country, but of another country. Mm -hmm. And what you're sharing with us is that change can always come if it is wanted, and if there is a common vision, if I'm understanding you correctly. That's correct. That's correct. Thank you very much, Brian. <laughs> Over to Lisa. Lisa, you, of us sitting around the table, you seem to have the most recent experience of mobility. In other words, you are back in the United States, but you've had a time in Rwanda and you've fought there. What are some of perhaps the perceptions of Africa, broadly Africa, that you might like to debunk? For instance, should someone in your neighborhood or at the mall approach you and ask you about Africa, what would you like them to know and what would you like them to think less of in terms of any kind of preconceived idea? Mm -hmm. yeah, I like that question. I guess what I would start with maybe, or my impression when I went back these past four years, um, is there's more of a push for African solutions to African problems. So it's more of ownership, the Pan-African movement, just you know, not looking for outside solutions and people to come in, but you know, how do we develop our youth to solve the problems or move forward um, within our own communities? And you know, education is a big push now for women, especially. I don't know if you're familiar, Oral, with the founder of African Leadership University. I am. And so I think that's a good example. Right. You know, he's starting a leadership university, right. basically, not just to educate people, but to develop leaders. And right. you see a lot of that in a lot of programs. Our school was like that. And so he started in Mauritius, I believe. Mm -hmm. he, also, he has a school in Rwanda now. Right. And his idea is to create multiple um, schools in, in, you know, as many countries as he can. And, and, you know, just based off what she's saying, like, African solutions for African problems, like Africa leading the agenda mm -hmm. in changing yeah. the destiny of the mm -hmm. continent. Mm -hmm. It's it's just amazing, and Rwanda is always like a beautiful, you know, example for me when it comes to talking about Africa and how we can make it happen despite all the difficulties that seems to be at the forefront of the media. Look mm -hmm. at the war that Rwanda came from. Look at the genocide, the number of people that were killed in that short period of time. Mm -hmm. And for that country to turn around, look at its past and speak to its inner conscience and tell itself as a country that we're going to move forward and we're going to do it quick. It's just amazing, you know. And it, it gives me hope that we can tell our stories and we can tell it quicker than we think we, you know, we, we cannot. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you think that's uh, it's, it's because of leader, good leadership that, good, that yeah, change good, came about? Good leadership is always key, okay. but the people also must be willing to work with good leadership. Yes. So change is good. Change is always good. Change is always good. When the people enable the environment for that change, because you have also leaders dotted across you know countries, not only in Africa but in parts of the world, mm -hmm. that you know they have leadership that they wouldn't call good, and the people are not inspired within themselves to bring about the change that they are all mm -hmm. looking for. And, you know, Nelson Mandela said this, Kwame Nkrumah said this, Gandhi said this, you're the change you've been waiting for. No one is going to bring you that change you want if you don't go out there and look for it and fight for it. It's just that sometimes it's hard because of the conditions that exist. So when the conditions are right, you cannot stop the change. Yeah, to, to jump in there uh, very much. Do you read, does Oral's description of hope resonate with you on this, Lisa? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think um, with younger generation too, they're very confident and fearless. You know, and, and a lot of the social entrepreneurs that you see right. in so many countries that, are, that are, um, are just, you know, going for it and really coming up with these great ideas that are applicable. Um, not, not just actually in their countries, but abroad as well. Um, so yeah, hope and, and just kind of this, entre that entrepreneurial spirit of like fearlessness and excitement and willing to risk, take a risk, which I think has been 
um, a spirit all along, this entrepreneurial kind of spirit. But now with the tech revolution right. and, and there's you, you can just grow your business so much, so much faster. So, so yeah, yeah, I see that a lot. It's that's, really inspiring, actually. That's, that's awesome, too. Yeah, I wish that uh, South Africa could get that vehicle mm. that Rwanda has taken up, you know, in terms of the change that came about there, you know, I... I've seen some funny things happening, you know, like my brother over there said change is good. Not always good. Right. <laughs> I've seen stuff happening in my country in South Africa that's not good. Mm -hmm. You know, so they took an interesting I, re approach in Rwanda too when they fell back on the culture of like these communal courts. Yeah. And so that's kind of how they um attacked um most of the healing process. And so people would have to come forward and share their stories and and that was based on an old cultural uh, norm. And so they used that, and that was out through, throughout the country. And so, you know, just, just going back to, again, the culture and what worked and, and using that to heal something right. that had been. Right. Was there an immediate, uh, not perfect, but was there an immediate buy-in to this communal approach? To healing, or did it need to take its time? It's a really good question. I, I'm probably not the person that would know In, how to answer that, but observer. just, just a, you know, what I've read and all of that. Um, yeah, I think it took a while, for sure. And you know, even with any leadership, you know, you're still going to have people that are going to give pushback. But I know I've talked to people who have said that it did help them. It was one of the hardest things to like share their story, right. but it did help neighbors live next to neighbors, where normally, you know, they wouldn't have been able to do that. It wouldn't have healed anything. So, so yeah. yeah. We, I'm, I'm finding something that that most stories have something that binds them, and immediately what, what binds some of these stories I'm hearing from from all of you is the way we speak, the way we listen, mm -hmm. the way we privilege narrative in, in all the right ways to find out where people of a country, any country, have come from, how they are speaking themselves. And on that, I have a question for, for Angela, who is very well traveled. Yeah. Um, you've traveled around the African continent, but you've also been outside of Africa. And if, if I may ask you this, Angela, mm -hmm. when you encounter other African people abroad, how do you find them looking back, perhaps firstly, mm -hmm. to their countries, their home countries, and Africa in its totality, if they do? Have you had some of these encounters? Let me get, get back a little bit. Uh, back in my country, let's say, for example, Kenya, you know, the perception is that uh, Kenyans look at their own country as bad. They look at abroad as good. But when they travel out, no, the reverse is, they now say, no, oh, my country is good. Right. Yeah, you see, they, they, is it because, you see, I think the, the problem is, unless you experience something, that's when now you realize you're faced with the reality now. Mm -hmm. Because I remember very well, if I can, I mean, quote, one of, my pre one of the presidents in Kenya, Moi, Daniel Moi, he used to say, you, you people, you should embrace your own country because the moment you go out there, you will regret because there's element of culture impact and, uh, and also loss of uh, attachment because you have built friendship here and that kind of thing. So to answer your question now is that um, the perception is kind of... Uh, 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 People come here with, 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 with imaginary, imaginary um, thinking that when they go out of their country, everything out there is free, and they, they just go and pluck the land of milk and honey. Yes, <laughs> yes. <right. laughs> but what they don't realize is that when you go out, you go and work. And in fact, you work harder here than in your own country because here, they, they don't, the country is different. You don't have a brother unless you cultivate friendship in your neighborhood, but you have to work hard on your own. So the perception is kind of like, it's difficult to describe in the sense that um, you come out from your country, hating your country, 
hoping that you are going to get milk and honey out there. But when you reach there now, it's the reverse. <laughs> it's the, totally the reverse. So <laughs> most of the people I've met here, actually, most of them are wishing to go back. But the public now, there's no fallback because they never built a foundation when they left their own country. Right. Mm -hmm. So they left the hoping that they are going to get everything here. So whatever they had, they, they, they squandered. Mm -hmm. Now they have come here, they have hit, it's like from a frying pan to, fire. to a fire. <laughs> so, but mm -hmm. the thing is, is actually, the goodness is that if, uh, out of my own experience, if you are determined, and even there's a, there's a way, there's a, there's a will, there's a way. Mm -hmm. If you are determined, you can make life easier. It's only a matter of you working hard and um, reflecting that I'm here now. This is what I have now. I have to pick up from here. But if you begin thinking both ways, right. you actually end up um, a loser. So, the, <laughs> so uh, I hope uh, I'm clear that because it's difficult because if you come from unknown to the known or un, from the known to unknown, it balance the equilibrium is, is kind of difficult. So it's a tricky question, it's a tricky mm. way of life, it's a tricky uh, way of seeing things because you come from a different kind of uh, different kind of life, a different kind of life. But my advice is this, out of my own experience, is that embrace the new life and move forward from there. Because if you look back, yeah. you'll never succeed. Never. The, just the kind of passion behind your, your response mm. almost motivates me to almost bounce the same question to Lisa. As an American who worked in Africa, were there perceptions of America and Americanism yeah. that mm. you had to find yourself negotiating? Yeah, it's, I think it's hard to go someplace as an American because there's so many American identities. Like, you can't go as one person and represent the population because mm. you, I definitely don't represent um, many Americans. Um, so, so, yeah, so there's that, you know, I'm just one person, but, you know, there are a lot of different cultures, a lot of different languages. Um, and yeah, you know, there's a lot seen in the movies, you know, people expect yes. that you live in a, you know, 20 Houses. room house and everybody <laughs> drinks scotch at 11 a.m. And, <laughs> you know, um, yeah, just, just all of those things. But, you know, a lot of places that you do go, you, you are very wealthy. So it's also considered if you're, if you, you know, considering that as well, um, mm -hmm. where you are and kind of, um, yeah. You find yourself fielding questions, um, basic cultural questions even. <laughs> what is a baby? No, mostly, mostly people say, why aren't you married? That's, that's the question uh, I get <laughs> nine times know. out of ten. <laughs> why, why, don't, why aren't you married and why don't you have children? Those are the questions I get. Um, no, I think, I think people think that they know like, what the United States is. And back, you know, what you're saying, like, I don't get a lot of questions about what it's like because I think people... Most yes. people think that they yes. know, and it may be true and it may not be true. So actually, yeah, I don't really get a lot of questions. In, in well, now your point opens up another question, and this is for the table, uh, for, uh, for Brian and for Oral and, and for Angelo. Coming to the United States, did you have preconceived ideas, perhaps <laughs> following Lisa's point, based on television, based on media? Uh, what were your perceptions? Perhaps we could start with, with Brian on this. Yeah, sure. Um, Lucky for me, I've, I've been here in 91, and I came over uh, in 92, 93 for two months. So we traveled, you know, those days, uh, Delta Airlines had a ticket where you could, it's a family pass, they called it. So you'd pay $120, and you can fly wherever you want for the two months. That's great. It's, yeah, it's like a sta <laughs> on standby basis, but you always got on. So we traveled this U.S. flat. <laughs> we went from from the East Coast to the West, to North, mm -hmm. South. Yeah, we had a pretty good idea of what we were in for. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like a huge culture shock for us um, coming here. Our kids, my kids, Lisa and Jamie, they were they were young. Uh, Lisa was a year old. Jamie was five oh. years old. Yeah, okay. How old are they now? Oh, they old. <laughs> 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 Not dad to reveal that on TV. <laughs> yeah, the eldest one, Jamie, is married 
which is a little, have a little grandkid. And uh, Lisa is pursuing uh, public health, her master's in public health, she'll be done next year. Cool. So yeah, you know, it was, it was a smooth transition, it was fine. It was just hard work. Yeah, that's, 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 that's right. I worked seven days a week. Hmm. Seven days a week, you know, my wife had to go back to school. Um, she went back to college and uh, obtained a degree in nursing. Uh, and I had to do all the work and it was, I had to take care of the two kids. You know, it was, it, that, that was hard, you know. But it was, we had, we had our goals in plan. We had short-term goals and we had long-term goals. And that is what, that was my driving power behind me. Right. That was the wings beneath my wings. Uh, the <laughs> wind beneath my wings. Is anyone else right. hearing that, Madla? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, very quickly, yeah. perceptions of preconceived ideas before you first arrived in the United States. Um, my story is somewhat like his, but not entirely the same, in the sense that I had an opportunity to know what to expect in America before I got here, because my, my father is also a journalist. I didn't copy him. You but did. yeah, you my did. father is also a journalist. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, he, he's very well traveled, and um, he speaks about five international languages, wow. English, uh, French, uh, German, uh, Spanish, and Italian. And he speaks about um, Local dialects. Five local dialects. My mm -hmm. mom speaks about eight local dialects. So, so are we getting on or are you okay. going to catch up? <laughs> I, I, I speak just four local dialects. One of them is Chi and thankfully or miraculously I'm an interpreter with the Fairfax um, County Public School System uh, interpreting the, uh, the, the Chi language of Ghana for the mm -hmm. school system. So but yeah, I, I just had an opportunity through my dad's travels you know, around the globe to be sort of like prepared for the American experience, right? So, but still, when I arrived, there were still these culture shocks. Of like, these guys, they drive on the parkway and they park on the driveway. Hmm. You know, rush hour is like when the car goes super slow. Mm -hmm. Do they drive on the wrong it's... or the right side of the road? <laughs> yeah. how, how, do we, how do we configure that? <laughs> just while, while you ponder that, I just have to very quickly turn it over to Angelo. Uh, I'll say a little bit about friends I've met. A number of friends I've met, most of them had a funny perception because they thought everything is free here. All those mm -hmm. I've met, even those who have gone back to the country, back to their country, they said, no, I made a mistake by going out because I thought everything is free. And when they land to the, from the airport, they are given a job, job straight away from the airport. That's what they had, they used to think. But for, you know, for me, having worked in Europe and um, that kind of thing, and traveled also to most of the countries in Africa, I knew what I was coming to do because, because uh, my idea was just for my education for my children because they were between the ages of uh, 5 and 15 when I came in. Well, Angelo reminds <laughs> us that sometimes we voice the stories of other people, mm -hmm. people who perhaps aren't joining us around a table where we can chat away and create community of dialogue and change and, and exchange, exchange of stories and experiences and histories, but we'll leave it there for now because you've experienced us experiencing one another on national TV, which wasn't awkward at all, and there are some things that we have to take home with us. I think each one of us has heard something that we will take home, and we hope there's something that if you're in your own home right now that you're already taking from this. For now, this has been a community of of people sharing stories and predominantly across the Atlantic Ocean. There's a deep history there and there's a deep future there. Oro especially reminds us of that. And that is what we think we might close on, to take these stories home and to think these stories into the future. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> Marvelous. <laughs>